Hello, and welcome to another edition of Wave Lab Workflows. My name is Justin Perkins. Today we're going to be discussing all the different ways of converting the sample rate of audio in WaveLab Pro. And depending on how you use WaveLab might um, dictate which is your preferred method. You know, there's a big difference between mastering an EP or an album or doing sound design work or library music work or all sorts of different things. You know, there are some cases where somebody might prefer the batch processor or I'm going to show you my preferred way for working on regular music albums. So we're going to go, go through all that. Uh, for those that are just tuning in or watching for the first time, there's a website called wavelabhelp.com, and that will link you to all these live streams, some of my WaveLab settings and preferences, um, and some other resources for getting started with WaveLab or using WaveLab. So wavelabhelp.com, everything over there is free to download and access. And as I mentioned, thank you for tuning in. Looks like we have someone from Canada and Sweden. Um, if you have any comments on the audio quality or anything, I monitor the chats as much as I can. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask them. I'll address them during the live stream or at the very end, if you have any general questions about mastering WaveLab. But otherwise, we should just get right into the sample rate process. Um, I'm going to start out by showing some of the most basic ways of doing sample rate conversion in WaveLab. Just kind of the, from the quickest, um, quickest, simplest way, but maybe not the most ideal to Again, how I do it at the very end, which I've showed in some of these videos, but we'll get into the details. Um, so we're going to go from basic um, to all the way to how I do it. I'm going to show the batch processor. I'll show just the audio editor, all sorts of things, um, different ways to do it. Um, and before I forget, I basically subscribe to the philosophy of working at a, the highest available sample rate to lock in all the processing and then working my way down from there. So I'm going to, you know, simulate doing an album where, where we're working at 96 K sample rate and then kind of working our way down from there to get all the deliverables and things like that. Some of my process goes back to the old days of wave lab when it had the crystal resampler, which honestly did not sound that great. Um, I put a link at the top of this chat for a website called Infinite Wave, and that's a comparison of different sample rate converters. You can kind of see some of the artifacts of various um, audio programs and how they handle sample rate conversions. So that's at the top of the chat. Um, I think it was WaveLab 9 that switched to the SOX algorithm, which is a very, very good sample rate conversion algorithm and something that you sounds great you know you can use it for music sound design i have no problems using it i'm also going to demonstrate if you prefer to use your own sample rate conversions such as weiss Seracon. Um, the one in isotope rx is pretty well regarded or you may have your own favorite third-party sample rate converter that you want to use and incorporate in your mastering work and it's very easy to do I'm going to show that towards the end with the customized duplicate montage feature where you can do an external conversion and recreate your project at a lower sample rate. But I just want to kind of give you that background that some of, some of my processes come from the old days of WaveLab. And if I started using WaveLab today, maybe I'd be working a little bit differently, but I want to cover all the bases and show every possible way that I'm aware of to convert sample rate. And now that... Um, the SOX algorithm is in WaveLab. It sounds great. So I guess let's get started. I'm going to open up a file in the audio editor. And for those that are new to WaveLab, WaveLab has two environments. It has the audio editor and it has the audio montage. You can see it's changing. And there's a whole video about the difference between these two environments. But let's say that I've opened this file. Basically, I just want to show that changing the sample rate 
changes the bit depth. So we have other things to factor in and think about just besides sample rate. So I'm going to play this file. It is 24-bit 96K file. And you can see on the internal bit depth meter of WaveLab that it's reading 24-bit, which is expected. Let's say we want to change the sample rate, and I'll get into more detail about what I'm doing here, but I'm resampling the audio live on playback to 44.1 kilohertz. And now you can see that the bit depth is 64-bit floating point. That's because the processing occurring to change the sample rate is higher than 24 bits. So if you have a 24 bit file and you have a 24 bit 96 kilohertz file and you want to convert it to 24 bit 441, you do have to think about dithering, whether you want to dither or truncate that data. There's no right answer other than using your ears and deciding what's best for your project, but you should be aware of it. Um, which is, I'm going to get into more detail again, but just be aware that just changing the sample rate, as you can see, turn this 24-bit file into floating point, and it's just playing live on playback. Um, so I'm going to turn off the resampler and go back to the original file. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is I'm going to open up a different file so I don't mess up my presentation here. I have a folder of stuff that I can just make a mess out of. So let's say we have a 24-bit 96K file. It can be any sample rate, really. Um, the, the absolute fastest, quickest, easiest, but not best practice, in my opinion, way is to go... You can open a file in the audio editor. You can go to Process tab, Resample. And this is going to let you pick a variety of sample rates to change the sample rate. Now I'm going to pick 44.1. But as you can see, there's no dither settings. So it's kind of crude. It's kind of, and there's no automatic dithering that I'm aware of. So when I press OK, yes, it is going to change it to 44.1. But did it dither or truncate? I don't know. And um, the same is true if you go the other way. Or even if it just inherits the original bit depth. So I'm going to open up a 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz wave file, and I'm going to resample it to 96. And I'm just doing this to prove the point of now it's, it's upsampled it to 96, but it's still 16-bit. So I don't really think, you know, this is good for just really quick, like I said, quick, cheap sample rate conversion, but you don't really get any options or dither choices. Um, something to be aware of in the preferences, too, is in um, global audio. There is a resample conversion setting for these practices where you don't really get a choice, whether it's loading in a file or what I just showed you. You probably want to change it to best um, just, for, just to be safe. But when you do other forms of sample rate conversion, you can choose the quality in that regard, but just something to be aware of in the preferences. So I don't really care for this version because especially if you're going to do a whole album, you wouldn't really want to do every song one at a time um, using that method. But if you just have one file and you need it converted quickly, that's an option. Just open it in the audio editor, choose the resample. But again, you don't really have control over bit depth. You'd have to render a new file and change the bit depth as well because there's no um, bit depth choices um, in there. You have to actually render the file. So that is probably the simplest way to do it. Um, I did also want to show that um, aside from dithering, we have to care about or at least think about the peak level changes. So again, here's that. Um, let me open a different file that's a little bit louder. Um, so this file is peaking at, has a digital ceiling of minus 0 0.3 when I play it back at 96 kilohertz, the native sample rate of the, of the uh, master. Watch what happens when I do resampling to 44.1. The peak levels are now slightly louder. They are minus 0 0.26. And these, I'm going to see what I have it set to. Because you can change this meter to be 
digital peaks or true peaks. So now when I change it to true peaks, it's going to read even higher as I play this section. So my whole point is, if you're working with louder material especially, you want to be aware of obviously bit depth changes when resampling and also peak level changes when resampling. Because if you're already this close to the ceiling, the digital ceiling, you can get yourself into a little bit of trouble um, by just resampling. As you can see, these true peaks are reading much closer to zero than you than than they originally were. So my other point is when I do my longer demonstration of how I do it, I have I have the option to add a true peak limiter after the resampling process and decide if I want to address those or let them exist. So just be aware that things change when you resample it an audio file it's not quite as simple as as you may think it's not so those are some things that i'm going to be talking about as i give some other examples um, so let's say you are in the audio editor you i'll get to the montage in a minute because that's where we do a lot of or at least i do a lot of my ep and album mastering even single songs i master in the audio montage but let's say you don't want to do that you have one song open in the audio editor it is a 24-bit, 96 kilohertz WAV file. Um, no, there's a couple ways you can you can do it here. You can go to the Render tab. You can choose Edit Single Format. You can change the sample rate in this menu, and this is where again the that behind the scenes preferences resample quality is going to come in handy. So you can, you can set the desired sample rate in this area and, and change it to 44.1. That means when you render the file, it's going to resample it. Match input stream just means match the sample rate of the, of the montage. And again, you want to determine the bit depth. Now, if I was trying to render a 16-bit 44 um, kilohertz sample rate wave I, I wouldn't use this method because i want to be able to control the dithering and as you can see um, we don't know when and where the dithering is going to happen so i would not be changing anything in here i would simply go to the master section set the resampling to 44 one in the master section we have for a good reason there's two extra slots one's for if you want to add a true peak limiter you know, that, that occurs after the resampling, you could do that. Uh, WaveLab comes with one. And the, the Peak Master or the Brick Wall Limiter. I have one that I like a little more because it gives you the delta, so you can actually hear what's going on. Um, but for sure, you'd want to add some dithering. And WaveLab comes with Lin Pro Dither. So you could set it to 16-bit as it is here. You can decide if you want auto blanking on or off. Auto blanking just when it detects, I believe it's 500 milliseconds of silence, it turns the dither noise off. Um, so we don't want to get too far into the weeds of dithering, but that's, that's a place where you could insert your dither plugin to um, manage the sample or manage the bit depth after the sample rate conversion. And then you could choose to. I don't have many presets in the audio editor because I just don't use it, but I could do 16-bit wave. I'm just going to render it to the desktop so it's easy to find. Um, I'm just going to call it test. So this is how you would possibly, um, you know, if you want to take a 24-bit or whatever, you know, a higher bit depth and sample rate file and, and get a 16-bit 44.1 using... The audio editor and again this this is not convenient for doing eps and albums this is just if you have one file um, and i can press start rendering and it takes a little while to render because it's actually doing sample rate conversion on the fly and um yeah so let's open that file it opened by itself and now you can see that it's a 16-bit file at 44.1 sample rate so that's again probably if i was going to use the audio editor that is how I would do it, because you get a little more control over the, um, the dithering and when it's happening. And then again, if, if I wanted to insert before the dither, I could insert 
a true peak limiter to manage the peaks that are going to occur from sample rate um, conversion. So that's another way of doing it. If you just want to do one song and you want a little more control, there's the audio editor using the master section. Now, the thing I don't like about the master section is um, the master section is for the whole program. So you have to save and load using this um, little star down there. You have to save it and load it specifically for that file so you can recall the settings. And depending on how you have your preferences set, that preset file is either stored right next to the audio file or it's stored in a hidden folder on your computer. I'll show you here. It's this preference right here. And as you can see, this is stored in a, a cache folder and it's still set to WaveLab 9 for some reason. But it's not ideal in my opinion. So I really, I really just use the audio editor for listening to files before and after I do mastering and I really don't do any work in the audio editor, but I just wanted to show you that it is possible to do it there. So I'm going to make sure I have everything turned off. Um, before I get to the audio montage though, I want to show the batch processor because people seem to love batch processors. I don't really love batch processes, processors for making all my deliverables because you get yourself into a bit of a dithering mess because let's say you have your high resolution masters at 24 bit 96 K. Well, for one, you've already dithered once or truncated to 24 bit because your processing in your, in your main mastering montage was happening at floating point. Even if you load in 24 bit files to master, um, again, the processing, let me just show that real quick to some, for, for those that don't know, um, I have a couple captures from analog I can load in here. These are 20, um, as you can see from the bit depth meter, 24 bit. Um, as soon as I start doing any processing, let's say I put an EQ on this track, see it's floating point. So all your, you may think you're loading in 24 bit files and working in 24 bit, but you're not because the plug, the WaveLab um, engine and the plugins are working at, um, and you can, 32-bit float or 64, you can tell um, WaveLab which to use. And some plugins are going to have their own limitations, of course, but you know, you're basically working at higher than 24-bit, even if you load in 24-bit files. My whole point was, I don't think it's very convenient to render 24-bit 96K masters and then downsample those to 16-bit 44 or whatever else you might need, because now you're adding multiple bit depth reductions and multiple dither stages, it gets messy. But some people love batch processors, and that's fine. Um, you can use the batch processor to sample rates convert. So what I'm going to do is show you that anyway. I'm going to load in, and forgive me if I'm a little slow, because I really don't use the batch processor in WaveLab, but I'm going to load in um, I am going to load in four files that are 24 bit. So this is like, and why is it not letting me load them in? Try that again. I'm going to kind of simulate what I was just saying that some people like to do. Insert. Oh, I was doing a montage. That's what happens when I try to talk and do stuff. So I'm going to load in four files. Let's say I, I I rendered some high res masters and now I want 16 bit 44 versions. And some people like to really split it up and they want to render MP3, 16 bit 44 one, 24 bit 48 K. I just think that it seems like a good idea in theory, but it just creates more problems and I, I can do it just as fast, but without the um, dithering complications or truncation complications that you that happen when you just take your 24-bit high res and, and want to spit everything out from that. But I have loaded the four files in here. Um, so in the batch processor, you can do all sorts of things. And 
Um, I have... I did make a preset, but I'll show you how to do it from scratch. Um, so in the left side here, and there is a whole video on the batch processor that I did with Ian Stewart. Actually, he did it more than I did. I just asked questions. But let's say you want to do some resampling here. You can go to um, the master section plugins area, and you can find resampler. And then, of course, you would want to find a dithering plugin. Again, St uh, WaveLab comes with Lin Dither. So you could add the resampler, and you could choose your desired sample rate. This is where you get a quality option of, I, I, I see no reason to not choose best. Um, you can choose the actual sample rate. And then because of what I demonstrated where the process of sample rate conversion will increase the bit depth no matter what, you're going to want to add a dithering plugin and if you're making 16-bit 44 one waves, you would did there to 16-bit. If you're making 24-bit 44 one waves or 24-bit 48K, you would, of course, use the 24-bit dither. There are some advanced options with noise shaping, dither type. Uh, we're not going to get into that today, but um, maybe we'll do a dithering live stream. So this is your basic way of loading in the 24-bit 96 uh, waves. And... We're, now we're going to downsample them. So there's a few settings to be aware of. There's, um, by default, it will just make an output folder, output subfolder in the main folder, or you can specify your own path, which is what I'm going to do. Because um, I want to change this. I really like WaveLabs editor because you can... It's being invisible for me right now, but you can type in your own thing. This path doesn't exist yet, but when I hit start, it's going to exist. And now we want to go to the format tab. We want the files to be 16-bit, but again, telling the files to be 16-bit doesn't mean that it's dithering for you. You have to, WaveLab is very, and most programs really are very literal. You need to insert the dither plug in yourself, um, obviously last in the chain, so there's no further processing after that. Um, so you have to specify that the bit depth you want to render and, of course, be dithering to that to, to, to do it correctly. Um, output, you know, you can, there's, we're not going to need a naming scheme for this because we don't want the file names to change, or at least I don't. So we got the output path selected. We got the format selected. There's some other options. Um, I tested this earlier, and with even with this setting, it's going to inherit the metadata that my master files have so you don't have to redo any metadata entry um, and again there's some other advanced settings that you can watch in the uh, batch processor episode if you um, are interested but I'm going to press start and now these files are processing and I made them alongside the The folder I'm showing you now is the source files, and this is the batch processed files populating in. So now we do have 16-bit 44.1 versions of those, and we even have the metadata intact. I can open up this app and show you metadata stays. But, but the problem, in my opinion, is that we don't know if and what peaks changed in this process, if it... Um, if, if the digital or true peaks are hitting zero and sounding a little crunchy, if that's a problem or not, that only your ears can decide that. Um, so we didn't, ins I could have inserted a, a safety limiter in between the resampler and dither, but I would honestly kind of be guessing because I don't know what's happening yet. It's happening, you know, it's rendering faster than real time and there's no way to really monitor that. But in theory, we do have these files. So some people like to use the batch processor and just spit out files and call it good. I, for me, that I just can't get behind that because you're there's a little bit too much detail that you're overlooking or not really closely watching. But if you need to process a large group of files and resample them, that's one way of doing it. Um, and of course, if you're working with audio that doesn't peak near zero, 
you know, if it's dialogue or quieter music, then obviously it's not going to increase that much. But if your peaks are, you know, anywhere less than a decibel close to the digital ceiling, you're in danger of the peaks, you know, hitting zero when you resample, which could be a problem, could not. That's, there's no way to give a concrete statement on that or a blanket statement, but it is something to be aware of that happens. So just going to check my notes, make sure I'm not skipping anything, but I showed the basic audio editor. I showed the master section with that. I'm showing you the batch processor. Um, there's one more method that I'm going to show you before I show you how I actually like to do it, which some people might think is a little too protective or slow, but again, I think it's the best, the best way it covers all bases. It also covers gapless albums. I do a lot of projects where songs overlap or crossfade, and sometimes they don't start as albums like that, but you never know when a client is going to say, hey, can we crossfade songs three and four? And then if you're rendering, if you're trying to take a shortcut with your rendering and processing, suddenly you might have a case where you got yourself a problem because now they want songs to crossfade. And if you're taking some of the shortcuts I've mentioned in other videos, you might have a glitch or a pop or a tick when those two songs trans transition. So again, I like my workflow to kind of work for every EP and album situation. I don't want to think about it. Um, it does take a little longer to render the full montage each time, but I don't think you really gain any time by taking a shortcut because then you still have to put the thing back together and check it and things can go wrong so uh, there's a reason why i do all this stuff a certain way but let me go back this is a let's see if it opens this is a this is a, actually a test montage i have for testing plugins and the song you know if we had an album with overlapping songs obviously the two clips would be overlapping and there'd be crossfades and whatever um, but this actually simulates gapless playback very well because when I play this test, this is a test tone chopped up into tracks. When I play this test tone, there there is no disruption in audio, and I can show you on some of the meters here. When it transitions to the other clip, there's no little tick or pop or glitch. It's just smooth. So this is a, this is a montage that I use for. When I get a new plug-in, I'll, I'll do some rendering to make sure that there's no issues at the heads or tails of the clips. But this is also going to work well for my demonstration here. So again, this is a 96K montage. And let's say we've, we're mastering this album. We're happy with how it sounds. Um... If you want to take a shortcut, if, if you need to render 16-bit 44-1 waves or a DDP from your master montage with all your plugins, again, I don't like to do that. I like to render the whole montage as one long file. There's also a rendering episode where you can watch me do that and explain in more detail why. But I, when I'm done mastering an album and ready to render it, I render it as one long file first, and I'm going to demonstrate that in this video too. But the reason being is to lock in all these transitions because if you have a lot of plugins going and you try to render track by track, that's a lot of cold stops and starts, or it's, it's a lot of hard stops and cold starts, which means you're very likely to get some sample disruptions at these changes. Now, if you have an album that has true silence between the songs, you're less likely to A, have those issues and B, notice them. Um, that, or they might not even exist if you have true silence. But if you have a, a gapless album or tight transitions, it's really my advice to render the whole album as one long file first. And that's not a wave lab thing. I know other mastering engineers that use other programs that do the same thing. One long pass to lock in the processing, and then you kind of split it up into tracks. And wave lab makes it super easy. Not only to do that, but also to get down to other sample rates, which I'll show as the final demonstration. But let's say you don't want to do um, what I think is the best thing, which is fine. There's many ways to do the same thing in Wave Lab. Let's say you want to just cut right to the chase and you have a 96K montage and you want to render 44.1 versions at 16-bit. Um, again, I'm not going to insert any plugins, 
but so it renders faster. But of course, you can insert your clip effects on each song and your master, your montage output plugins for everything, um, you know, limiter, things like that. But the resampler only exists in the master section, so you can't you can't resample in the montage output section, which is another reason I don't use it because. I really don't care for the master section because, as I mentioned, it's not saved and loaded with any particular audio file or any particular montage. It's a separate entity um, that you have to manage and save and load with each project. So I know for a fact that I will get myself into trouble if I have to, aside from saving the montage, if I have to save and load the master section. So I prefer to keep all my plugin processing in the montage so it's fully saved with the montage file just like you'd expect any other DAW session to be. So that was a little bit of a tangent side rant, but let's say I'm happy with how this montage sounds. And I'm going to render it. I want to render 16-bit 44-01 waves. So I would, of course, open the resampler section turn it on, set it to the desired sample rate, 44.1. So you can't see this, but my interface is indicating that it's playing at 44.1 sample rate, even though the montage is 96K, so it's always going to say that down there, but we have resampler active. Now, we also are going to want to put a dithering plugin on because let's say I'm processing this song. It's now floating point audio. Um, not only, well, let me back up a step. The resampler is off, so it's playing this test tone. It's registering as 24 bit. As soon as I turn the resampler on, you can see it's floating point audio. The same would be true if I'm adding plugins, which you normally do in mastering. So, what do we do about that? We need to dither. So, as I showed before, you can insert do their plugin in the master section and you can see it, it showed up at 16 bit already so you can see the bit depth meter reducing to 16 bit so in theory we're good uh, we like how the ma the master sounds we have we're resampling in the master section it's dithering to 16 bit all that's left to do now is render a wave file of each track or a ddp What am I going to call this? I'm just, I don't normally do this, of course, but I'm just going to save everything to the desktop so I can find it easily to show you. So I'll just call this 1644 live render. And as you can see, I've chosen 16 bit format, numeric prefix. All this stuff is kind of in my. Render presets, which is a really great tool if you're not using this in WaveLab. It's a huge time saver because it sets all the render options to how you want them for various things. It saves a lot of time and, and makes it so you don't miss anything or screw anything up once you set it. So I'm going to render a 16-bit 44-1 wave of each track or each, you know, each Track is a strange word. I'm going to render a 16-bit 44-1 wave of each song on the album, each CD track, each album track, and we'll watch that go. Oh, I actually have to, because I never use the master section, I use my preset that bypasses it on rendering. i got to disable that. I knew that went too fast. So now it's, re now it's resampling on the fly and rendering a wave file of each track. We'll just take a couple more seconds. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to load this back into a new montage and test it. So I'm going to bypass the master section by pressing this button. I'm going to create a new montage. I guess I should have done it there, really. I'm creating a new 44-1 montage, and I'm going to load in. The files that I rendered, except... Where are they? Let's do that again. Did it go to a strange place? Uh, 
I think I rendered them to a strange place because I don't normally do it like this. So let's do that one more time. We'll have to find those later. I apologize for my little slip up there, but let's render these and then we're going to load them in. I'm going to show you why I don't like this method either. This method can work. Again, if you have an album with true silence between the songs, you're probably not going to notice what I'm about to show you. But the other reason I don't like this method is because now you're rendering all the plug-in crunching, the number crunching, multiple times. It's going to have to crunch all the numbers to render the high-resolution master, you know, the 24-bit 96 master. Then it's going to have to crunch the numbers again if you want to render the 16-bit 44 or the DDP or the MP3s. So the other reason why I do things the way I do them is because I'm just crunching the numbers one time to lock in that processing. And then from there on out, the renders go very fast because the only thing that's usually running is a dither or maybe a, a true peak limiter. Um, so it's very fast renders from there on out. But the first one does take a while. But despite some of the less than ideal things about that method, it, I think it does save time overall. So let's load in these files I just rendered. And I'm going to, this is something you should do anyways, is test, you know, test your renders in a new montage to make sure there's no plugin glitches. Um, so I'm just butting up these files back to back. So this is how it would be, you know, when you submit them to streaming for digital distribution. And what you're going to notice here is I honestly can't hear it, but you can see on the, the spectrometer that when it transitions when it transitions from song one to two, you're going to see a little disruption. See that? It just, it's a little hiccup. I'll do it again for the next transition. I, that was the playback one, but there is the... Now, I can't hear it, but an issue like that is only going to compound once you include third-party plugins, hardware, all sorts of stuff. Um, it's only going to compound issues like this. So I really don't like to render you know, my track by track renders with a bunch of A, plugin processing and B, resampling. Um, it's, it doesn't help the situation. It's a big, kind of a big ask to get sample perfect renders when you have all this stuff going on. And so that, again, that's why I render the full album or EP or even the single one long file first and then work my way down from there. So as you can see, slight disruption on the track transition. Now, again, if you're doing two, one or two seconds of silence, maybe this isn't an issue, but for me, I don't like that. And it's only going to get worse with plugins and other processing. So, but I just wanted to show you that you can, if you have a high sample rate montage, you can enable the live resampling. And when you render, you know, it'll, Though the master section is after all your montage plugins, after all your clip effects, track effects, montage output. It's after all that. So it is at the end of the process, but it's not quite sample accurate enough, in my opinion, to, to do gapless masters. And the same is true. I was going to show it with the batch processor, but if you take... Well, let's just do it quick. Um, let's go back. So this is my 96K test montage. I'm going to turn resampling off. I'm going to turn all this stuff off. Let's render some 24-bit. Again, this is not how I like to name things normally, but for the sake of this video, we're going to render 24-bit 96K WAV files of each track. It went very fast. Um, now, if I load these in, because there's no sample rate conversion happening and there was no plug-in processing happening. Um, we're not going to have a disruption when I load in these 24-bit 96K versions back-to-back to, -back to you know, just test them out. When I play this, it's going to be... The timing of that was weird, but the, you, you can see that there's no disruption when it switches from one song to the next. It's a perfect sample accurate render. Um, it's great. 
if I use the now the, I should have done this in the batch processor section, but if I go to the batch processor, load these in. So these are the ones I just showed you on playback. They were totally fine as far as that transition goes. If I, yeah, I thought I saved one. See, I don't use this enough to even know where the presets are. So now I'm going to take the ones, the, the 96K versions that were perfect, I'm going to resample these down. I'm, I'm going to use the this setting, the subfolder output, just to make things quick and easy here. So let's downsample those gapless 96K waves that were perfect. Let's resample them down to 441. So these files were once perfect. Let's watch what happens when I play these back. Again, this isn't easy to hear, but you'll see there's a little hiccup there when it changes tra track. So not a problem for a lot of albums, but could be an issue for some albums. So again, that's another reason why I just, I really don't use any of the methods I just showed you, which is kind of ironic, but again, you're free to do whatever you want. I'm showing you all the possible options before I get to the way I like to work. Um, just making sure I didn't miss any notes. I see a question from uh, Michael. How do I keep markers in place to move audio around lock markers? Uh, well, when you use the CD wizard, the markers are bound to each clip by default, which is great. So I'm moving these songs to add space between them. And the markers are locked. If you manually create markers, they are not bound to each clip. So you have to go to the markers tab, or you can right click on a marker and say, bind this marker to the start of each clip, the end of each clip, the audio samples of each clip or detach. So right now this marker is attached and I could go detach now when I move it. So if that didn't answer your question, just send me an email or something, but hopefully that did answer the question about locking markers. Um, it looks like I've never done it, but it looks like you can lock um, markers in this section as well. Um, it didn't do it because it's bound to the clip, but hopefully that answers the question. But the key is to use the CD wizard. This is my default setting for the CD wizard. Once I got my clips in place, I run the CD wizard to create the markers and by default, they're locked to that. Um, so I wanted to show you some of the reasons why I do things the way I do them now, because I find that everything I've showed you so far is a bit of a compromise or not ideal. Um, unbind, um, detach is the way to unbind markers from a selected clip is this bottom option. And now when I move it, it's like that. Um, but I wanted to show you again, why I do things a certain way, because there is a way to get perfectly gapless masters at any sample rate. And there, and while I'm doing that, I'll show you the way that you can use your own sample rate converter. Because some people are sort of attached to Weiss Sericon or RX, even though the SOX algorithm in Wavelab sounds very good. I come from an era where it was using the Crystal Resampler before SOX, so which did not sound that great. So I was using an external sample rate converter. And that's what led to some of my practices here. But... Um, I'll show you, I guess, why and how I do things a certain way. Let me, I'm going to do it twice, actually. So let's say this is an album and I've dialed it in. Um, I'm going to use this montage because it's going to render very quickly because there are no plugins. But of course, as I mentioned, you can put plugins on each song with the clip effects and then maybe like a final limiter, true peak limiter on the output to kind of effect. Oh, whoa, I hit my table, hit it affect everything equally, you know, after the clip effects. So I'm not going to have any plugins going so it renders quickly, but what I do um, for reasons I told you about is I render the whole montage as one long file first. And some people find this to be not ideal, especially if you're just changing one song, 
But again, at some point, you're going to have to have the whole album as one file. So to me, it's not a big deal to render the whole thing again, because you're going to need it that way at some point, especially if you branch off and do a vinyl master or cassette master or the DDP. You know, it doesn't make sense to me to start taking shortcuts because you're going to just create other problems. So this, this is something that works for me. So let's say I'm happy with how this sounds. I do my initial render. And I'm going to be working a little bit slowly because, again, my folder system is not how it normally is for a project. But let's just try to get somewhere that is sensible. So my first render goes in a folder called 96K Renders. The reason that it has, the renders are going to have their own folder is because the files are going to have the same name, but they're going to be at different sample rates. But obviously you can't have... A bunch of files with the same name in the same folder the computer doesn't like that so i don't want to get into naming schemes if this was an album i would name it a little bit differently well let's just do it how i do it so the artist name would be jp render test start would be the name of the album version one so i'm going to render this it's going to go very quickly created a new montage um pretend that i had a bunch of plugins going this is all my this is my master locked in with a bunch of processing that sounds exactly how I want. But instead of this version with the plugins running live, I copy the name and paste it here. This is the version with all the processing locked in. So there's nothing else to do here except dithering. Um, so I would add my dither plugin, 24 bit dither. Um, I would, now I'm going to render these track by track to their own folder. So I'm, if I wanted high resolution waves, now I can render a wave of each track to its folder and everything's great. But like I said, I don't, I do not take these 24 bit 96 waves and downsample them for lower, um, bit depths and sample rates. I could do that, but I don't think that's the best practice. Um, and here's how you use your own sample rate converter. You could also do this with the WaveLab batch processor, the same effect. In fact, I'm gonna use Isotope RX batch processor. I'm gonna, again, I'm not gonna take those track by track. These would be my high, high res waves to submit to streaming, if that's an option. I'm not gonna to touch those. I'm gonna take that floating point render of the whole album as you can see it's 10 minutes long so i guess maybe it's an ep i'm going to downsample that to 441k make i'm making a folder for the 441 version so because the file is going to have the same name so as you can see i'm taking the 64-bit float render of the full project uh, it's not dithered yet but all the processing is baked in i'm going to um, convert that whole thing down to floating point 441. Now, RX can accept 64 bit float, but it can only create 32 bit float at this time. So that's what we're doing. So that's processing. And in the meantime, I can flip back to WaveLab. Um, we're going to create a customized duplicate montage of this, um, not the original montage, which is this one. We're going to make a duplicate of the one with all the processing baked in. As you can see, the markers are there, the CD text is there, the metadata is there. It's all great. It's, it's a mirror image of the source montage, but all the processing is baked in. Um, I'll show you the slow way on this pass, and I'll show you the fast way on the next pass. But the slow way is new audio montage, customized duplicate, and it brings up this window and it's going to say where is the new file that you want to use to create the customized duplicate it has to have the same file name you can insert variables if if you want to use the same folder you could have variables um, in the file name and you could tell wavelab to look for or ignore those but that's for me that's too much typing i just make a separate folder and that's where the so i'm telling wavelab to look for a file of the same name in this other folder. And when I do that, as you can see in the bottom, I have 
a 44 one montage. Um, all my markers are there. Everything again, exactly the same. Um, I could save it. The montage. And of course my did there is already there because, um, if I undo the dither, now it can be a great example because it's a test tone and there wasn't much happening, but technically this is floating point audio. So I need the dither. You'll see it better when I get to music. Um, but let's say I wanted to render 16 bit 44 on one waves. Then I just have to change my dither to a 16 bit dither, which is, I have a preset for that. So now I'm ready to render, you know, 16 bit 44 one waves. And hopefully I don't make a fool of myself here, but when I load these in to test them like I showed you with the first one, let's see if it's perfectly gapless. So there you can see when, when the song changed from song one to two, you can see my dither noise now, but you don't see that spike where there's a sample disruption. So now I have perf perfectly gapless 16-bit 44-1 waves. The ones I showed you before were close, but not perfectly gapless. So as you can see, that's how you... That's also... I'm going to do a whole stream on gapless as well. But in my opinion, that's the best way to handle sample rate conversion is to lock in your process... For EPs and albums, lock in your processing at the highest sample rate, highest native sample rate, uh, floating point bit depth... Um, you could use the WaveLab batch processor or RX or Seracon, whatever you like. Convert that floating point thing of the whole fi of the whole project down to 441. Do a customized duplicate, and now you have again your a mirror image of your carefully assembled montage with your markers right where they need to be, and the titles and the metadata. You don't have to redo any of this work. And I know this is may seem like a lot, but when you're not explaining it in a video and you get in the habit and you have a, maybe a stream deck or shortcuts, it goes very fast. And with this method, you know, you're not dithering more than once or you're not truncating or you're not potentially getting some true peaks that you want to be aware of and decide to manage or not. So that example was with a test tone, not very exciting. I did grab a montage that I recently mastered and i was aware that it had some true peaks after conversion so i saved it let me make sure i'm opening the correct one that isn't going to mess me up later so i'm going to save either processing time but this is an actual record i mastered um, this morning technically I did some of the singles earlier, but I assembled this master this morning and I got a bunch of plugins going. Um, I did, I, I did a lot of the processing with analog gear, but then I loaded them into montage and did a little more work. As you can see some level automation, a couple, couple EQ tweaks, nothing major. And then a final, I like the inflator. Technically there's only two limiters. Then there's the true peak limiter, which I'll get to later. Um, but I, I, you know, we're getting off track here, but basically I was happy with how this sounded. And just like I showed you before, I rendered the whole thing as one long pass. So instead of rendering track by track from this point, I know it seems like a logical thing because you do need a wave file of each song. But again, I think you got to think bigger picture. So I've already rendered it so we don't have to wait because this is going to take a little while to process all the plugins. But in theory, this is what I did. I rendered a 64-bit floating point um, wave of the whole montage to a folder called 96K Renders. I have nothing going in the master section. And as I mentioned, my render preset bypasses the master section just in case something would accidentally be set. I don't want it to be a part of my processing. So basically, I rendered this and it, I hit start this one took, you know, 10 minutes. I'm not going to make you wait 10 minutes. But when it was done, it looked like this. It looks like a pretty loud rock album. And again, um, all the markers are 
carried over. And this one actually does have a gapless transition, if I remember. It has some, they wanted, they had some talking that they wanted to overlap. They wanted a song to end and some talking of the next song to happen during that song's fade, the tail, the sustain of that last note. So this would be a good one to show you as well. Um, so anyways, I have a, what I have here is a, a version of the montage with all the processing baked in at 96k the audio itself is floating point so if i disabled the dither you'll see that the audio is floating point so i mean i i believe in keeping the audio floating point and only dithering one time um, and when i'm working on a project that hasn't been delivered i you know in theory i could render 24-bit 96k waves from here but i don't do that right away i don't send that to i don't send my clients the high resolution files until they've approved it most clients don't have the ability to correctly listen to 96k waves because they're going to load it into itunes or something and it's not it's just going to be resampling on playback i give them to them at the end so they can submit it to um, their distributor or listen to them or put them on Bandcamp or whatever but my whole point is we have the the processing locked in. We have a dither inserted because we're going to need it eventually when we render 24-bit 96K waves. But um, what I do when I'm first working on the record and need to deliver it for approval, again, instead of rendering track by track or doing anything, I go to um, a sample rate converter of my choice and I grab that floating point 96k wave of the whole album as you can see it's 36 minutes and i downsample that to a new folder called 441 so we don't have duplicate file names and i downsample that again this is the whole record it's not song by song and this is going to take maybe just another minute i'm going to grab a sip of water now when the project's approved i'll come back to whatever the approved high res version is and render waves of that and it'll be fine but to show how quickly you can do it um, i have shortcuts if you download my presets you'll get them or you can create your own but you can create your own custom montage duplicate shortcut so that it what mine does is it copies the name of the montage first that you have selected and then it brings up that customized duplicate window and then you have to manually point it to the folder you can see the file just showed up so i'm pointing to that folder now i have a 441 version of my montage and i just have to press command s and paste um, and i'm going to change it to 2444 because it's a 441k montage and even though the audio is floating point i have a 24-bit dither and from this point i could render my 24-bit 441 waves um, I'll get to that in a moment, or I could do a save as and insert a 16-bit dither for rendering a DDP or 16-bit 441 waves or MP3s. Um, so let's just stay at let's just stay in this montage right now. So this is what I'm talking about. With True Peaks. You can see. Let me open this file in the audio editor. You can see maybe if you have a good eye and a good monitor. Um, let me go back. The 96K version, let's analyze it. The 96K version should have pretty, basically the, the, the limiter ceiling was set to minus 0 0.3. Let's see how good of a job it did. I'm analyzing the 96K version of the whole record. Um, so there's an analysis of the digital and true peaks. Totally fine, not a problem. I would render those as is for the high res version. Now let's analyze the 44.1 version that got downsampled, which should go a little bit faster. You're going to see here that um, we're going to have some overs. We have digital peaks that reach plus 0 0.5, true peaks that reach even just a touch higher. Whether or not those are a problem is an opinion. Depends on the project. I'm not going to say it's a problem, but it's something to be aware of. So um, 
the amount of the peak level change totally depends on the material, how it's processed, the limiter you use, the settings of the limiter. Some projects don't have any digital or true peaks after I downsample them, and some do. It's just the nature of the way the audio is. But now I'm aware, I can, I can see them on my screen, but we can actually prove that there are peaks and we can decide if we want to deal with them or not. Um, and I should have did that back in my, um, this version. So if I decide that, um, I would like to address these peaks that happen after sample rate conversion, I have a quick solution, a, a preset chain, which adds one of my favorite plugins from Tokyo Dawn. And the reason I like this plugin is it has a delta mode, so I can listen. I can't play this audio because of legal reasons. But when you're in delta mode, you can hear, you don't hear the song anymore. You hear just the little, you can see the meter moving on the gain reduction. I have it set to minus 0 0.1. That's just going to prevent any new peaks from hitting the digital ceiling and potentially sounding crunchy either now or by the time it hits streaming. So... This is optional. You don't have to do this. This is what I like to do on some projects. Some projects I decide that the overs are fine. I just let them fly and everyone's happy. Other projects are a little more delicate where you maybe you want to manage the true peaks after a conversion. And again, some of the earlier methods I showed you, you just don't have that option because they're you you just you're doing it so fast, you're skipping these steps, you don't have the chance to analyze what's happening after the conversion, because you're converting, dithering, saving the files. It's just trying to do too much at one time. This is kind of the baby steps version. So the whole record, it's going to be different, but you know, you can decide if the true peak limiter is doing more harm than good when you play it and listen to the stuff it's catching. Um, so again, I'm not saying you have to do this. It gives, I'm saying it gives you the opportunity to add a, true peak limiter if you want to now this the reason i chose this limiter it's it's different than just turning the whole file down to avoid peaks it's it's not turning the file down at all it's, it's an additional true peak limiter that as you can see is only catching it's not doing anything now it does things every once in a while when when a new peak was found that happened after the conversion so in my opinion it's the safest cleanest way to, to to address this kind of situation is this particular limiter with this particular setting because again i'm not changing the ceiling that would be this knob here i'm just changing the true peak um, detection so that's that's kind of how i do things and then we can render 24-bit versions of this did i render anything yet i can't remember so I didn't render anything for this project, so I can... That's right, because I was showing you how I really deliver stuff. When I deliver a project, I like to deliver 24-bit, 44-1 waves. And I have a special web player that plays gaplessly. It's great for mastering approvals. So that's one way people listen. And then I also provide a DDP with a DDP player. And it's, I've already made this montage, so I have to overwrite it. It's going to warn me that I made it already. It's rendering in the background, so I can actually start changing my stuff. I can change this to 16-bit. I still want the true peak limiter, but I've changed the dither to 16-bit. So from here, I could render 16-bit 44 one waves. I could render MP3s. It's all very, it's all very quick once you figure out the path forward. I, I think it's actually faster and better than batch processing because you're not compromising the dither settings or having to change it. You know, the batch processor is just, it's fine for some things. It's fine. I think it's fine if you have a hundred files that need to go from one format to another, but for mastering albums and stuff, I think this is better because you get more control. You take baby steps, you see what's going on um, in each part of the process. So these folders are populating. I didn't add any artwork, but as you can see, all the files have metadata that I only had to enter in one time at the very start of this mastering session. I don't have to redo any metadata, but it's all there. And now that those are done rendering, I could render a DDP. 
So it's all very fast and easy in my opinion. Um, if anyone has any questions about what I just did or sample rate conversion, now's a good time to ask them because I'm going to be wrapping this up soon. But um, so now as, as you can see, it's rendering a DDP, which is one long render. And that's actually how I just kind of discovered this whole method of making sure that your gapless records are totally seamless, sample perfect, because I had a case where I was trying to render 16-bit or maybe 24-bit waves at 44.1. song had a... Um, the album had some gapless transitions, but I had plug-in processing going, and I was trying to render track by track, and every time I would test the transitions, I would get a little tick or a pop, and it wasn't related to zero crossings, which I can talk about. It was related to trying to render track by track with too much processing, and you're not getting a true representation of how it's going to play through if you render track by track with processing. So you kind of have to break it down into steps of lock in your processing as one long pass and then break it up into tracks. And I got that idea, and it turns out it wasn't original, but I thought it was original for a little bit of time. But because DDP, my DDP didn't have that problem. The DDP had perfectly seamless transitions because I realized the DDP, despite what's going on on the screen, it renders it in one pass, and it adds the track markers you know, in the DDP file, but not the audio is just one chunk of, it's one long file, and it, the DDP is what breaks it up into tracks. So then I thought, well, why don't I do that ahead of time so that my waves are also don't have that issue. So that's how I got the idea. That's why I do it um, again. Once you get in the habit of it, it's very fast. Um, I, I don't think some of the some of the shortcuts that may seem inviting, like just rendering everything from here and resampling. You know, when you render from your master montage, that takes a while to process all the plug plugins. So I like to just do that long process once instead of for every format. So you save time there. You don't have to worry about, you know, I only updated song three, so now I got to splice this into some other folder or where does it exist? And now it's time to make the vinyl master and which versions is which. I, Even if I only change, let's say the client had a change, they want to make one song a little bit louder, I would do save as version two. If, if it was this song they want louder, I would turn it up. I still render the whole thing start over, but now everything's called version two. And again, some people think that's crazy because you've only changed one song, but if you're doing EPs and albums, you're going to want all your final settings in one place like this, because once they approve it, now you got to make the vinyl master and you're going to want to make it from this source so you can undo the limiting or ease up on the limiting and all your final settings and versions are in one master montage. For me, that's the version with the little underscore to me that indicates that it's the version with all the processing so that when you look at it in a big list it stands out instead of the derivatives that have all the processing baked in so i think i've gone long enough on the topic of sample rate conversion um, that kind of ties into my rendering practices i realized as i did this video but again there's a there's a reason there's a there's a method to the madness because Again, while most projects have true silence between the songs, like, like this, even this album, most of the songs have true silence between them. You, you do run into cases where they want a little overlap of something, and the processes I'm showing you cover all the bases from gapless albums to albums that have normal spaces and everything in between. I just think it's my opinion that find a process that works for all occasions so you don't have to um, slow down and think about, you know, sometimes shortcuts end up not re being really shortcuts at the end of the day. There's a question. What's your method of handling the finder window folder management when setting up your folder structure? Um, I'm using two things. Um, when I'm in WaveLab, you're probably seeing... A little add-on it's called default folder X it's a very very affordable little app 
um, that you add. And what I like about this is I have a shortcut. I think it's the default shortcut. I'm sure you're all familiar with when you go to open a file or do something, it opens up a folder that is nowhere near um, where you're trying to work. But with default folder X, in one command, it snaps to your recently used folder. So it gets you to where you want to go faster. I find it to be a big time saver uh, instead of wrestling with the native finder and all that stuff. I don't use the WaveLab file navigator. For me, that's just, um, it hurts my head um, to look around in here. This doesn't work for me. Um, so default folder X helps you get to recent folders a lot faster. I mean, there's a whole menu system, but I use a lot of shortcuts. But this shows you all your recent stuff, and you can do all sorts of shortcuts. And then, yeah, I use Pathfinder instead of the Mac Finder for kind of a silly reason. Um, I like it because you can automat it automatically adjusts the column width so you can see the whole name of what you're working on. Um, you, know, you can see it kind of expanding and contracting because um, the for whatever reason the Mac Finder does not do that. Um, there's some minor workarounds, but they're not really a solution. Um, I can show you this album, the real folder. Um, you know, I had my original files, unmastered stuff. I do upsample. I'm a believer, like I said, of upsampling to 96 if things come in at 48k or lower. That's a personal choice. Um, these are my captures from analog and my montages. This is the 96K. This is what I showed you in the mock-up session. Um, this is the folder of files I sent to the client to approve. This is the DDP I sent. So that's kind of my layout. I just cleaned up my hard drive, but let me see if there's any delivered... Um, any delivered albums, perhaps. I can show you real quick before I wrap this up. Delivered albums. I just I just did a pretty good cleanup the other day, so most stuff is in progress, um, and that one's a little bit different. I don't have a good fully complete folder right now of something that's finished that I can think of, but hopefully that um, gives you a little bit of insight. Well, I, I guess I could open up. This is an archive of my hard drive. Certainly there'll be an album in here. I'll try to find one that went to vinyl. There's a million of them that went to vinyl, but there's one in particular I'm thinking of. So this is like when a project is done. I got my 16-bit 44-1 waves, the zipped version of all these. The numbers indicate the bit depth and sample rate. The vinyl master, I made two vinyl masters because he wasn't sure if he was going to do three or four sides. That's why there's two vinyl versions and instrumental. So hopefully that helps kind of getting into the weeds here. But thanks everybody for watching um, this episode on sample rate conversion. I am going to do a special live stream on gapless albums. We should do a live stream on bit depth. Um, if you have any suggestions for topics, feel free to visit um, the WaveLab users group on Facebook. That's a great place to suggest topics for future ones and also to ask questions about what you saw here. WaveLabHelp.com has all the archives of all these live streams because I know I referenced a number of them in this video as far as batch processor in depth, the difference between audio montage and audio editor in depth, rendering in depth. Um, I really wanted to just focus on sample rate conversion in this episode because there's a lot of shortcuts that you can take, but I really strongly believe that the last way I showed you where you render everything first to floating point, check it, then render track by track, it's gonna it's going to prevent a lot of issues. I see so many people on forums having problems with gapless albums trying to render their masters and they're getting a click or a pop and it's usually not a zero crossing issue a zero crossing is where you have the track marker um be located obviously where the waveform crosses zero 
which is going to be different in your left and right channels anyway. It's also going to be different, you know, if you try to do this in your source montage, where's that overlapping bit? If you try to overlap, you know, you can't tell where the actual zero point's going to be in your source montage because whatever this waveform is is going to change when it's combined and rendered. So usually gapless problems are because of how they're rendering um, their your master files. And again, the way I showed you just avoids all those issues. I, I do a lot of gapless albums and can't think of the last time that someone came back to me and said there was an issue with the transition clicking or popping so that's that thanks for watching thanks for the questions and we'll see you online somewhere otherwise we'll see you near the end of april for the next live stream and we'll see you then